Hey guys, we are now officially live as always. We're gonna give everybody just a minute to join in. People get that little notification that Crappy Professionals is live. And I don't think most people besides Andrew typically click it the second it pops up. Not me, the <laughs> other Andrew. So we're gonna give them a moment to join. Now I know everybody here is in different parts of the country. Is it starting to feel like fall where you guys are at? Oh yeah. Finally. Anybody have snow right now? Not great. That's good. Did you have it a few weeks ago, Tamara? Yeah, we did. I, man, I couldn't believe that because it was like 100 one day, then like snowing the next. It was crazy, yeah. And the snow stuck too, which is weird. It didn't, how long did it take to melt? Um, It was gone in a couple days because it went right back up to 80 degrees, which was lucky. But Now, I imagine summer snow is not a normal thing, even in Colorado. It has <laughs> snowed on the 4th of July before, so exactly. it's possible. <laughs> That sounds like the name of a beer, not something that should actually happen. Yeah. <laughs> so let's dive into this, guys. We've had a lot of posts recently in the group about people adding food to their menu. Obviously, everybody's just looking for new ways to survive. And when you can add food in, it's just another option to ideally get your guests coming out, maybe spending more money, hanging out. You now, all of you have food in some capacity at your breweries. And I'm excited to hear about your unique operations and just messages with a few of you. You know, I was kind of fascinated how you've made it work. And I'm very excited to learn just as everybody else is. Now, Andrew, tell us who you are, where you are, and a little bit about your brewery. Sure. Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm the director of brewery operations for Uncle Bear's Brewery in Gilbert, Arizona. And we have, we started out as a restaurant company, so it's a little different. Uh, and then we added the brewing. So we've got three restaurants plus our tap room here in Gilbert. And uh, we've been around since 2000 as a restaurant company, 2013 as a brewery, and opened this location in 2018 without food. Took a little while for us to buy a food truck, and then we, we were doing food trucks on weekends, but it wasn't very consistent, and guests really, when it's not consistent, they don't look forward to going because they say, oh, maybe we'll drop by there and they'll have food, maybe they won't, we'll have a beer and take off. So uh, we decided to purchase a food truck, which now lives here and we're really just kind of getting it ramped back up. We've been doing chips and queso and a chicken salad sandwich as our food options, but uh, starting this weekend, we're gonna be having more food options. And that's it, that's what, that's what Uncle Bears is doing right now. Excited to learn about that. And I guess your other locations have had food for quite some time. Right, Prior. yeah, they have their full menu, which is enormous and uh, we just kind of pull a couple things off of their menu to run our food truck. Oh, very cool. Now, Tiffany, how about you? Tell us a little bit about Maysville. <laughs> Tiffany, are you frozen on us? I'm gonna shoot her a message, guys, but Kaylee, we're gonna skip to you now. So I know you guys are a fairly young brewery. I know my favorite thing when I talk to you and Jake is just watching you progress early on because you literally put the whole journey on Facebook and Instagram and Jake presented at our last conference just sharing that story. I think it was really motivational and just inspiring in general, people starting a business, especially a brewery. But Hi. tell everybody else. Me, one of the oh, co Tiffany, are you back? back. We're, we're gonna skip um, to you we're next. Located in we're located in go We're gonna give that a second, guys. So Kaylee, I was saying you guys opened just a little while ago you want to start yeah. by telling us a little bit about the operation that you have? Yeah, for sure. So we celebrated our one-year anniversary. Um, officially, it was the last week of March of this year, so kind of a stupid time to try to celebrate an anniversary. But, um, yeah, we're, we're the new guys on the block here in Kalamazoo. We're in the southwest Michigan area, for those of you who aren't familiar with the great state of Michigan. Um, we opened early last year. Um, had no intention of ever having food, honestly, from the beginning. We just wanted to do beer. We didn't want to get into the restaurant game, didn't want to be a restaurant. There are a number of places in town that are like full restaurant breweries. That was not, not a thing for us. Um, quickly learned that we had to have food if we wanted to serve beer. Usually we had to have food here. Um, tried to, we thought about going the food truck route, you know, just having a schedule of food trucks in our parking lot. Our city was like, nah, we're not gonna let you do that. So we decided to put a kitchen in. So um, yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that later, but um, 
we uh yeah we're we're kicking we're making it through quarantine one takeout order at a time and can't wait to be able to get back to full speed here soon hopefully awesome well thanks for joining us today kaylee tiffany can you hear us now I think there might still be a little lag there. So Tamara, we're gonna go to you now and hopefully we can hear Tiffany shortly, but Tamara, do you wanna tell us a little bit about Golden City? Yeah, so I work at Golden City Brewery, which is in Golden, Colorado. Uh, we opened in 1993 and we've actually always done food with the exception of the first um, few months that we were open. Um, we weren't allowed to do anything other than sell beer to go when we first opened. Um, but we do easy things like beer brats. Um, we do um, like we, the beer brats has been like the most like uh, we've done the whole time. Um, and that um, sells really well. And it's super easy. It's all pre-cooked stuff. We have a tiny little space and a tiny little kitchen. So we don't have like a vegetable sink or anything. So everything we do has to be pre-washed or pre-made. So as far as that goes, it's been kind of easy. Our biggest problem is the space. Um, but we do like soft pretzels, we do beer brats, we do like we get frozen edamame and heat it up and that sells surprisingly well. Um, so that um, those kinds of things we do. Um, we sell a lot of soup in the winter. Um, starting in 2013, that's when kind of the food truck boom started for this area. Um, so we generally have food trucks definitely on the weekends because we have a large beer garden and the kitchen just can't keep up with the food. So the food trucks definitely help. Um, during quarantine, we have had food trucks pretty much every single day, um, kind of to help them out because I know they've been suffering a lot. Um, but I mean, they're all good people. So I like to kind of help them out as much as we can. Um, but yeah, otherwise we, um, as a brew pub, we have to do a certain amount of sales in food. I think it's something low, like 10 to 15 percent. Um, so we pretty much give away little snack pretzels and spicy mustard, and we just calculate the cost of that into the beer. Um, and so that's been keeping us at that margin. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I'm very curious to ask some more questions in a little bit about the food trucks and how, how they kind of go along with your current kitchen. That's a very interesting setup you have there. Now, Tiffany, we're going to give you a shot now. Okay. Can you hear can us? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. <laughs> okay. So I'm Tiffany with Maysville Brewing Company. Um, we're a small one barrel brewery in Maysville, Kentucky. So a pretty small town. Um, we also had the struggle of our city not allowing food trucks. The only time they were allowed is if it was a city sponsored event. Um, so I actually went to our city commissioners and they unanimously voted to allow food trucks. Um, however, the issue at that point was is because they weren't allowed, um, there wasn't a ton in our area. So we were just having trouble scheduling those. Um, so we decided to just add a kitchen to the brewery. However, I didn't want to take that on, um, on top of the brewery itself. And I hadn't worked in a restaurant since I was 16. So I feel like you should know what you're doing there. Um, so we had actually met a couple from, um, New Jersey who were, was interested. They'd actually bought a food truck just to set up here. Um, so we went to them and they were interested in just leasing space and they actually opened, um, they opened February 28th. So two weeks before everything kind of started shutting down. Um, but it worked out in everyone's favor because there's been many times during all this that if we didn't have food, we would have not been able to stay open with the regulations in Kentucky. So, so yeah, it's, it's been a blessing for us and a blessing for them. And um, even though they opened just two weeks before, they've done pretty well through all this. Sorry, I can't save this question for later, but you found a couple in New Jersey who now opens a food truck in Kentucky. They, they were from New Jersey. They had lived here a little less than a year. Um, Got it. They, they actually met us and we met them through the brewery. Um, but yeah, they, they had went out, purchased a food truck. Um, we had talked to them about, about food trucks setting up here. And um, yeah, so instead of a food truck, they now have a whole kitchen. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. That's a good story there. Yes. Now, Kevin, on to you. You're our friend today in North of the Border. Yeah, Thanks that's correct. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, 
yeah, Block Three Brewing Company. We're in St. Jacobs, Ontario, Canada, um, which is about an hour west of Toronto. If anyone knows their Canadian geography. Um, <laughs> so we opened seven years ago and have never had food in a brewery at all. Um, the one that was probably the biggest question we got. So we started investigating how we can incorporate that. And um, we don't have a three tier system. So I'm allowed to own a bar as well as a brewery. Like I know that kind of differs state to state, but um, so we basically bought a property in town and set it up as our beer garden. Um, it's got like a hundred seat outdoor patio, um, you know, like fire pits, the whole deal, right? Um, so we started that two years ago. Um, interesting sound. Um, right. Uh, so we uh, we we bought we bought the place. Um, we put a kitchen in and we initially had a guy actually renting the kitchen from us to provide food for our space. Um, and then he didn't want to continue that. So we bought him out of his lease and now we just own the whole thing. Um, our chef's from Mexico, so we do Mexican, uh, which might be a little out of left wing for a beer garden, but it's been a hit. <laughs> <laughs> and how far is your new location or your, your food beer garden from your brewery tap room? Uh, it's like a hundred meters. Like it's like a two minute walk. So they're hand in hand. Now, do you deliver from one location to the other? Or do they have to walk to the beer garden to get what they need? Uh, we can do that usually on like a weekend though. It's just way, way, way too busy that we can't spare a person to go do that. Um, but if someone comes into the brewery and says, Oh, I love your beers, but I, I want to have some lunch. At least now we can direct them to a space we own, right. You know, make, make their money, our money, right. Like instead of sending them to a different restaurant. So that's fantastic that you, you know, what seven, eight years go by and you add a location next to yourself to kind of solve the problem of hunger that all your guests had. And you know, what have you seen as positive through that? Are guests staying longer or any noticeable changes, more guests or just, what are your observations? Um, it's definitely drawn, it's become a thing. Like it's drawn people to our, our town. Um, it's, be, it's known as a, a cool place to go hang out um, as well as uh, like, it's now our largest licensee account. So the largest bar we sell beer to is our own bar. That's a really unique move right there. No, mm -hmm. for everybody else, you know, we've talked about a little bit of food trucks, bringing in someone else to essentially run your kitchen. What's your favorite part about having food at your brewery right now? We're going to get into the logistics in a minute, but since you've added the food option, just like Kevin was saying, what are your favorite aspects of having that available to your guests? Well, for us, uh, we have a large outdoor space and we do large cornhole bags tournaments and without food that just is impossible because if they're here for three or four hours they've got to have a food option so uh that's the big that's the biggest thing for us right now since we can't do that it already is kind of hurting but we're also down from we're only at half occupancy so i have 35 seats right now and it's really tough to run a kitchen with 35 seats to take care of. So we're in an industrial place, not a retail area. And it's a little tricky to get people down here. But when we do, if there's food, they stay longer. And that's a big deal for us. Now, Uncle Bear is, already has locations that do have food. And they are primarily food as opposed to beer? Yeah, they opened as sports bars and have always had craft beer. And then when we added our own beer, it just was now we have all the taps in all of our restaurants are our beer. So, so when you brought over food to the tap room and in, in the capacity that you have, I guess you took the skills and the training from the other locations to make sure you were doing it correctly. Right. Well, I was a restaurant manager for 20 years, so I had that. I had that going. What, what restaurants were you in prior to that? I got the whole tap room part of the brewery. I was the head brewer and they said, oh, you can do the tap room too. So when you look at the beer and you look at the food, what part of your operation is your favorite to interact with? Do you enjoy the food aspects? I <laughs> like brewing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you speak and stand for so many brewers who just get thrown in and have so many hats that you wear, but yeah. Andrew, I we had a tap room manager and once COVID hit and she moved to one of the other restaurants as a manager. Um, so 
instead of managing her managing the tap room, now I'm doing it all myself, which is not forever, but just for now. And I can kind of, we, we do have a restaurant operations director who is very helpful to me in uh, creating menus. And we actually get our food through one of our restaurants. Since we have the food truck, you have to have a commissary attached and they have a full kitchen license over there. So we can use that as the commissary and get prepped items in from them. Now, looking at your sports bar locations and looking at the brewery location that you're at right now, what's the biggest difference? Uh, size is definitely part of it. They are huge. They We have three to 400 seats. Um, well, between 200 and 400, depending on which location. Uh, but they all have patios. We have a patio. There's a lot of similarity. The difference is our capability for preparing things. We don't have a fryer in our food truck. We have a flat top and we have a uh, salamander. So we can do some, we can do burgers, we can do sliders. And that's pretty much what we do, which is kind of what we do already. So uh, we get lots of help from the restaurants too. If someone, if I mean, I only need one cook. So if he needs a day off or is sick, we have other resources that we can pull from for that. Very cool. Now, mm -hmm. Kaylee, I want to go on to you as you finish sipping your beer. Well, wow. Now, you guys did not plan to have food at your brewery. When you right. guys were initially creating the business plan, was it even you know a blip on your radar about adding it? No, initially, like I said, we wanted to do beer because we knew beer. And I was a server bartender for 10 or so years in college and after. Um, so I've been in the restaurant industry, but never on the kitchen side. We just didn't have that background. And it was really not something we wanted to be known for. We didn't want to be a restaurant. We wanted to be a brewery. We wanted people to come here for our beer, um, not because they wanted dinner. Um, and through the planning process, we kind of learned there are local ordinances that, you know, if we're serving alcohol, we have to have food. It's required. We could get away with a popcorn machine, some chips, some pretzels, you know, light stuff. But the more that we talked to people and the more that we really dived in, dove in to the area that we're in, we're not in a downtown area. We're not, you know, in a place where people are going to do a brewery bar crawl of six different spots. Um, we're in a family oriented kind of suburban. We're just outside Kalamazoo, uh, which is a moderate sized city. So the area that we're at, the neighborhood that we're in, it's people that are, they're, they're families, they're young professionals. Um, we're near a number of large manufacturing businesses, uh, places like Stryker, um, that you've got people that are looking for happy hour. They want to come after work. They want to have dinner. They want to, they want to look for places that are going to have food and beer. So the more we, we dug into it, we kind of realized, all right, if we're going to make this sustainable, um, we're going to, we're going to need to do food. So we, we brought in um, a member of my family actually has years of chef and kitchen management experience. So he kind of came in and partnered with us to help us create a menu. Um, we wanted to keep it bar food, but a little bit nicer. Um, we didn't want, you know, I don't want steaks. I don't want entrees. I don't want I don't want people to come here expecting fine dining because you're not going to find it, but I want it to be a little bit nicer than just uh, fast food type stuff, you know? So having Brad come in and help us build a menu was a critical part of that first step. And we really sat down and figured out, all right, what do we want to have here? We want burgers, sandwiches, you know, some salads and appetizers, things that are casual, and easy to put together. We have a very small kitchen space. Um, we can do about four people in the kitchen without everybody tripping over each other. Um, so he did a great job of putting together a menu that is simple, but with some cool twists on it. Uh, lots of burgers, lots of paninis. Um, and then I think one of the most important things that he did for us was to create a menu where a lot of the ingredients are cross used across the menu. So we don't have items on the menu that I'm using cooler and freezer storage space or specialty equipment for one thing. A lot of the menu items that we have are similar. You're going to get same toppings that are on one burger are also used on a kind of loaded tot or they're used in a salad. Um, and that was something that was incredibly helpful to us to figure out how do we maximize the small amount of space that we have, but create a menu that's full enough that there's some good options for people, but we're not needing way more storage space than we have 
We don't need way more equipment than we can fit or afford. Um, so that's pretty much where we got started. And for now, we just actually added pizzas, which is a fun add-on. And again, using a lot of the same type of ingredients that we're already using in a lot of our other food items. Um, so yeah, I think the most fun thing for us now I can't imagine doing this without food. Um, we did have food from day one, so so we decided that before we opened. But now we created this place to be a gathering space. We have a good sized building. We have normally about 160 is our capacity. Um, and we just added, just about done with a beautiful outdoor space. Our beer garden is just about completed. Um, and we wanted this place to be somewhere where people come and hang out, where they meet family, friends, neighbors, or meet a total stranger and end up hanging out. And food really adds to that experience. You can obviously do that with beer, but when people are gathering, hey, let's meet for dinner, hey, let's grab lunch. We get a lot of people that come, you know, on a work lunch and they'll they'll come even have meetings here and they'll they'll do happy hours here after work and and things like that. So I'm I'm grateful that we took the leap to do it um, because it has really intensified that idea of hey this is a this is truly a gathering space. This is where you can come and spend a couple hours. And some people will spend a few hours drinking beer. I'm one of those people. But having food, having a place where you can grab lunch, grab dinner, even grab a late night snack, um, that's really elevated that experience for us here. Now, what are the hours of operation that you serve food? And do you serve different items at different times of the day? So that's kind of evolved a little bit. Um, we are, like many people, on a weird COVID schedule right now. Um, I don't know if this is the same throughout the country, but for us, finding kitchen employees is impossible right now. Um, here in Michigan, there's still some incentives to stay home. Um, the unemployment benefits are out there helping people get through right now. And there's some extra bonus money that's going out in some places. Um, so, so finding hourly employees is really tough right now. Um, so we're currently operating Thursday through Sunday. Uh, Monday through Wednesday are generally our slower days. So we, we've got a limited amount of staff right now and we're we're just limiting our hours that way. Um, however, in a normal world, we started out kitchen closed at about nine o'clock most nights. Um, we're generally open till 10 o'clock during the week and then 11 o'clock on Friday and Saturday. We're just not in a market for midnight or later. We we tried it out at the very beginning and no one was here. So everybody's in bed by that point. In this and, and, since you, and since you've added pizza, it's been a good addition? It has, yeah, yeah, people like it. And um, we have a very small, pizza menu, um, like a build your own pizza and a couple specialties. But um, yeah, we we do during normal times, we offer a late night menu. It's after nine o'clock, you know, the main kitchen closed down, you can't get burgers and stuff after nine. But we have a lot of our appetizers and our snacks and stuff um, for people who are just hanging out and want to have a light bite to eat. And that seems to work really well. Um, it's nice for us because it can help us save on labor. We don't need a full kitchen staff to serve two burgers after 9pm. Um, but being able to offer something for those later night guests, I think especially now that we've got our beer garden opening up, um, it's nice to have at least a couple of options for them. Yeah, definitely. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing all that. Now, Tamara, we're going to move on to you because I'm curious. You, know, you said you started a little small with your food operation. Is that correct? Yes. So what types of items did you initially begin with and how did it start to grow? So in the beginning, we just did pretzels and brats. Um, we would do like a lunch special, beer, brat, bag of chips, and a cookie. Um, and then um, like we have done in the past, like we got a whole like salad station and did like nice sandwiches. Um, but that for us was not sustainable because of the space and then the volume of customers that we get. So we, um, before food truck, we had a little agreement with the sandwich shop across the street to provide sandwiches after we like couldn't do that anymore. Um, and that worked out really, really well. Um, but then when the food trucks started getting popular, a lot of people would call us and be like, do you have a food truck? And if we didn't, they wouldn't come, <laughs> which got a little awkward because we're more about the beer than the food. Um, but yeah, so um, when the food trucks, like we don't make them come in the winter because we are like 90% outside, like we can fit like 12 people inside the tap room, um, much less now. 
so we don't, um, if they want to come out, they can come out. But I mean, I don't want them freezing all the time, the whole winter. So that's mostly when our menu expands. Um, and it really just depends on our staff and who's working there and what they want to do. If they want to do like a soup special or like, you know, we do, we've done like meatball subs and we've had like a panini thing. Um, it, we are really, um, like open to our staff and what the staff wants to do because that way it'll work out better for us in the long run. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, no, it definitely made sense. So with regard to your operation, what's the size of your kitchen like? So we, we are very, very small. Um, we did a renovation in 2014, which actually moved our taps back. Um, they took out the inside wall and the taps are where the wall used to be. So now our kitchen backs up against the taps. So it's all one space um, and it can get a little awkward in there. Um, if we usually we have two bartenders and a dishwasher. And then if we add somebody for food, like on a Friday or Saturday, it gets super crowded that way. Um, so that's one reason we rely on food trucks so much, definitely on the weekends. But in the winter and like on Mondays or Tuesdays, um, it's a lot more more doable for us without like running into each other and having a little bit more time to like create the food. Do you ever have plans to expand on that kitchen? I mean, I love the aspect that you bring in the food trucks and you want to help support the community, but would you ever like to see a higher percentage of the food sales stay in house? So we are in a historic district and we are not allowed to take up any more square footage on our property. So we can have a temporary structure, but we cannot build anything permanent, bigger. And we also don't want to change the integrity of the buildings. Um, and most of our space is beer garden. So take, building another structure, or putting something extra would ruin the flow of our area. Like our beer garden has completely grown organically. Like it wasn't planned. It wasn't like anything that we set out to do. It just kind of happened. Um, so we, we like that our ambiance is one of the huge reasons that people come. So adding more food probably isn't something we really want to do unless we have to. So, but going back to the food truck relationship, you know, do you have a revolving cast of food trucks come in? We do. So if we get a food truck that shows up and is reliable, we will keep them. Um, we alternate like every other week. Like we have a really good one that comes every other Saturday, every other Friday. Um, so we like to keep them around and then they're predictable for customers to know who's going to be here when. And that also helps too. I think that's one of the struggles so many breweries deal with nationwide. You said reliable. And I think having a reliable food option is great because if you're advertising so-and-so's food truck is going to be there on Thursday and they don't show. That's so how right. has managing the food truck operation just making sure that they're there when expected, they're reliable, they put out the correct products that you've asked them to do. How do you handle that side of the relationship? So since we've been doing food trucks for so long, we've pretty much stuck with the ones that show up and re are reliable. Um, some of them are like, our neighbors and our friends and so like we can depend on them and that helps um but we also we like to try out new food trucks because customers want new food options sometimes um so it really just depends on the day of the week and what happens um but the good thing about doing our own food is if a food truck does break down or doesn't make it on time we still can serve our food now so, that is a nice option to have yeah that that helps a lot that saved us a few times for sure now, you have the revolving cast of food trucks. Now, Tiffany, you only have that one special food truck that comes to your brewery. Now, do they serve a diverse menu or is it more so a certain, you know, style of cooking? What do you have them serve? So they they actually aren't in a food truck. Oh, that's They're right. You... Inside of our building. So talk um, a little bit about that and how that relationship they... works. So as far as their menu goes, um, they, like I said, are from Jersey, North Jersey, so really close to Philly. And they were upset that they couldn't get like what they consider a real Philadelphia cheesesteak when they moved to the area. So that's what they specialize in, um, which is really different than anyone else around here serves. Um, they're just, it's just a different type of Philly cheesesteak. Um, and then they also do a lot of appetizer things. Um, they'll do like different homemade things like the other day, a buffalo chicken dip. 
um, and they'll just have it available for the weekend. And once it's gone, it's gone. Um, so they do that kind of stuff a lot. And then as far as the relationship goes, um, in the beginning, it was scary because you really never know. Like, it may seem great, but you don't know how things will go, um, you know, on down the road. But um, they're just really laid back. They um, they kind of go with the flow on what we want to do as far as the brewery goes. And they stick to their, their thing, the, the food. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that we all complain a little here and there about, you know, things they do or things we do. But it's never interfered with our relationship. And we are, we're six seven months in now to having them in here and it started off with complete chaos and COVID season. So I feel like if we survive now, that, is the kitchen area, a shared space that the brewery staff go in as well, or is it more separated? Um, so it's actually, I can, now that I've moved, I can kind of turn. So I'm sitting in our tap room. And then if you can see that doorway mm -hmm. back there, I'm actually sitting at our bar. That's the doorway to the kitchen, but that's not where customers order. So we actually have a window that's built in. Um, they do all their own ordering and stuff. So they just get beer and drinks at the bar and then they order at the window. But their actual entry space is right inside of our tap room. Now, for a new guest coming to your brewery, do you find there's any confusion when instructing them how they need to order both items or how do you handle that if so? Um, sometimes we do, but there's a, there's a sign as soon as you walk in our entryway. Um, that says order food here. So most people see that and go straight there and then come to the bar. Um, every great once in a while, there's some confusion. Um, our setup's definitely not my favorite, not just the kitchen, just our kind of have to walk in probably like five feet before you see us at the bar and we can greet. So that's a little, that's more the confusion than the food and the drinks being split. Now, how long were you operating before you decided to bring the couple in to help run the food operation? So we opened in June of 2019. Um, so about seven, close to eight months, we were here with no food. And like others have said, we just constantly got that, um, do you have food? And we realized very quickly that to keep people around, that was going to have to be an option. Um, we would do trivia and people would leave immediately after it was over because they would come here right after work to do trivia. And by the time trivia was over, they were hungry. So we actually only got one trivia night in before we were shut down and everything changed. Um, but yeah, it went really well and I think it was going to make a huge difference for us. And I think we'll see, we'll see that as things start to open back up more. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will eventually. So kind of to go backtrack a little bit, the relationship you have with the kitchen that's in your brewery, you know, how did you discuss finances? I mean, is it a percentage deal? Are they paying rent? How did you handle the business side of before they even served anything? So at first we weren't really sure how we wanted to do it. Um, we knew we didn't really want to do food, but we didn't know that we also wanted to give up the revenue from, for food. But we thought about it, and the more we thought about it, um, we wanted to really just focus on the beer. And um, we thrive on events here. You know, just being a smaller area, we have to bring people in for other things sometimes besides the beer, and then kind of convert them to be a craft beer drinker. Um, so anyway, we decided after lots of thought that we would just do more of a lease. So they basically just lease the space. Um, and it's a split basically. So like if our utilities and our monthly rent, we basically, we pay the utilities, they pay the rent, but it still equals about the same thing. And then there's other things that we do that, like I said, are pretty just laid back on a lot of things. So we will just split the cost of many things, or if it's more related towards them, they'll just do it. Or if it's more related towards us, we'll just do it. And, you know, so far it's worked out. I know that not everyone can probably find that relationship. We, we've been really lucky there, but so far it's worked out for us. And have you noticed, I know there hasn't been a lot of times recently where guests have been hanging out, but when they first came in, were guests spending more time at the brewery? Were they drinking more beer? Oh, for sure. So our, um, our first two weekends that we had food here, I mean, obviously it was new and everything new is big so we don't know where that would have led without covid but um our first two weekends we did more in those two weekends than we had done i mean our revenue was probably up by 50 percent wow. you know compared to the last two or three months on friday and saturdays now and you credit that to the food options that you offered say that one more time you give the credit for that to the food off offerings that you had in the kitchen Tiffany, 
Uh, is that because of just the food that you had available to all your customers? I think we might have lost it's, Tiffany it's, there. You're breaking up really bad. I'm sorry. Well, I was saying, is it because the, those busy weekends, were they because of the food you had now available to your guests? Got ya. Um, I think so. We really hadn't changed anything from what we normally do on those those couple of weekends. So it had to have been related to food. I mean, there was no festivals going on or anything extra like that. So um, I definitely directly relate it to food. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a nice increase. Now, everyone else, you know, let's talk about the food that you have. Because Tiffany, yeah. because you're not running the food operation yourself, I can't imagine you know exactly what their sales are. Or maybe you guys are that open with each other that you do. But looking at like, you know, ratios, how do your food sales compare to your beer sales? I would love to hear, trying to go around the table, whoever wants to jump in first, kind of speak a little bit about the variety of your sales. And Kevin, I know you're in a unique operation, so I would love to kind of hear your feedback on just general changes too, since you added food. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, just in terms of the split. Um, so last year we did we did all bar service. So you ordered your beer at the bar and then you ordered your food at the bar and then we brought the food out to you, but it was really just like one bartender, uh, very low labor costs. Um, and then with COVID, we made the decision to do all table service, like a traditional restaurant. Um, and before when we were doing bar service, it was probably 70% beer sales, 30% food sales. Um, I mean, which is great. And then, We've seen it shift now where beer or sorry, food has overtaken uh, beer sales. The, the overall numbers haven't gone up much, like they've gone up a bit, but um, we're just selling a lot more food and people treat it more like a traditional restaurant now where they're they're going out for dinner or they're going out for lunch instead of just kind of lounging and, and drinking and snacking. Um, so that's also kind of guided our menu a little bit to make something a little more substantial. Um, if you're going to go out and have like a full dinner. Are you seeing a different clientele since you have more food options now? I, I think so. It's less, um, less locals, more tourists. Like people are, people are traveling. Like, so our town has, you know, 5,000 people in it, but within an hour's drive, there's like 7 million people. So we will get tourists from uh, like Toronto or from, Waterloo and Kitchener, which are the other big cities nearby Hamilton, um, which has been interesting with COVID because we got to keep track of uh, customers and have contact information for them. So you see a lot of the, the phone numbers and area codes of other cities. So people are traveling to come to our place now, which is cool, I guess. <laughs> That's interesting. I know most places in, here in the States, we're not tracking quite like to that level. Thank you for what it's yeah. worth. But, you know, looking at that operation, you're seeing lots of tourists coming in right now, <laughs> you know, based off of, you know, when they would come prior to you, you having the food offering, are they hanging out longer? Are they spending more as a whole? I mean, obviously they're enjoying the food options and you mentioned that the split kind of just shifted, but is it increasing the bottom line at all? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we're, we're, we're for sure busier than we've ever been. Um, it, just in terms of the restaurant, the brewery itself, um, it's probably the same with a lot of your breweries. We're doing a lot more package stuff than we're doing draft at the moment. But uh, the the restaurant for sure has gone up in, in sales, like record breaking weekends, almost every weekend this summer. That's great. Now, Andrew, kind of, I know you've been in the restaurant world a while. You know, talk about the food beer split that you have in the tap room, maybe versus your other locations. What trends do you see so our other locations are certainly more family oriented. Lots of kid menus, lots of uh, big patios, uh, high chairs, all the stuff. Um, they are about, they have full beer, wine and spirits at those locations and their alcohol mix is about 35%. Uh, here at the tap room, we are about really varies. I mean, there are some times when we're running 10% food and there are some times when we're running 35% food. Uh, it just depends. The busier the day is, the more overall sales we have, the higher our food percentage is going to be. Because if it's a slow day already, people 
I'm in and go, okay, I'm going to have beer too. looks kind of quiet. Maybe I'll have some chips and I'm out here. Uh, but when there's that activity in the general, people want to stay. So they stay longer. They eat more food. That's what we've seen. Now at the tap room, was the food truck there from the get go or did it add, you add it after the fact? We added it about nine months after we opened the tap room. I always wanted it to be not a restaurant. I mean, I wasn't in charge. I was just a head brewer. So someone else was doing everything over here. And uh, I really was like, ah, let's just be a tapper and they do it in other places and it works and it just doesn't work. Uh, we have to have food in Arizona. I don't, I think I can name two breweries that don't have food, that don't have a full kitchen. Um, so it's just, that's the way the culture is here is there's food at every brewery. It's very um, interesting how that varies by state and parts mm -hmm. of the country. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we got the food truck and it's a, it's a challenging position because it's one person in a truck. Oftentimes it's a hundred plus degrees out there uh, in, and then they're in the truck and then it's like 125 degrees and they'll get spurts of orders and they'll just go for an hour with nothing to do. And then they'll get like 10 orders and then they'll have nothing for an hour. So it's a challenging position to keep a uh, job satisfaction. And, um, you know, sometimes right now the plan is to do a scale back like paninis as our, as our next evolution of food for the tap room, just because I can have bartenders do that and they're multi-purpose. If I have to turn on the flat top, then I have to have a cook and a cook is not always multi-purpose. They may not just be the kind of person who wants to interact with guests and serve beer and be around. So for right now, we're doing that. Let's take this step and increase a lot the options that we're giving guests without it being like fully on the menu. Um, so then when we get to open up to 100%, and start to do those cool things again and other and have live music and have trivia and do the other stuff where we have activity uh then we're going to open the food truck up all the way and my next meeting after this is that whole plan with our restaurant operations manager Woo! we'll have to have a follow-up on that one cool yeah. good luck thanks well, tamara on to you um tamara so looking at your food options you know is something you've had over time. Is it something you see a consistent level of food sales or do you have it vary? I know you mentioned like Mondays, Tuesdays, you don't often have the food trucks. Is there a certain line you're riding that you expect as part of the, your, your business? Um, never expect food sales. Like we don't depend on them. Like if we sell the food good, if we don't, you know, whatever. Um, and I, haven't actually checked, but I would assume that the food sales does hover around that 15% or so, maybe 20%. It's not a, it's not a huge thing for us. Like we have a ton of students, like we are like three blocks away from School of Mines campus. So they um, definitely come in for the free pretzels. So like, as long as we're giving out free pretzels, that's like, that's fine with us. Um, you know, it's, not a huge thing for us. What's well, nice to have is just convenience. Mm -hmm, definitely. Sure. No, no, Kaylee, on to you. You know, since you've added food, I mean, you added it early on. You know, what's the split been for food sales versus beer, beer sales? And you have, have you seen it change over time? So uh, the first, the first couple of months, I just factor out in general, just because it was it was weird. Um, you know, everybody wants to come check out the new place, and. The first couple of months, honestly, with food was weird because we we had all these people that were coming in, don't even drink beer, and we don't serve anything else. So we have we have only what we make in house. That's what our license allows. So we have we do make a cider and we do a seltzer. Um, we have a couple sours that we'll do as a shandy to try and hit those. You know, well, I don't really like beer people, but we don't have spirits, we don't have wine, we don't have anything of that. You know, we don't do domestics, we don't have any of that kind of stuff. So. We had a lot of people coming in right at the beginning wanting to check out the new restaurant, which was frustrating because I'm like, we're not a restaurant. We are a brewery that makes food, but we are not a restaurant that happens to brew our own beer. And there is a difference. So 
we, it took us a couple months and and I think anybody who's going to add food is going to experience that a little bit where you're going to get all these new curious people that are going to show up. And we spent some time kind of training people wh who we are and who we're not and kind of whittling down like who our customers are and who they're not. And that's not to say that, you know, we've had actually a lot of great now regulars who thought they didn't like beer and then realized they did after they came in for food and we gave them, you know, I'm drinking our cream ale, which is our best selling. We tell people it's like PBR with flavor and it gets some of those, you know, I don't drink craft beer people or our ciders or whatever. Generally though, the folks who were like, oh, there's a cool new restaurant in town. And then they were snarky about, well, this is just a burger. Well, yeah, it's just a burger. So we got rid of those people and, and then things were good. But anyway, once we got past those first couple of months and we got rid of all the outliers, um, we're right around 50, 50 and we've pretty much stayed fairly consistent with that since, you know, for the last year and a half or so, um, haven't really seen, you know, when, when COVID happened, we shut down for the first day. We've never done takeout before outside of, you know, somebody sitting at the bar and saying, Hey, can I get an order of tots to go or something like that? But we've never done, we never advertise for takeout. We don't do delivery. We don't handle like Grubhub, DoorDash. We don't do any of that stuff. Um, so we flipped the script a little bit in March, figured out how to set up online ordering. We operated takeout only. That's what we were required to do here. We couldn't be open to the public at all. Um, so we, we saw a little bit of a shift there for a while. It was actually really interesting. We were doing way more food sales than we were doing beer sales, even though we were doing packaged beer. Um, so, so the last few months have been a little out of the ordinary for us, but generally speaking about 50, 50 beer to alcohol sales. Um, and yeah, that's, it hasn't really changed. So looking at 50, 50 split there, what made you want to add pizza? Since you've added pizza, are you seeing, are you seeing more food sales or is it more so complicating your menu? Well, so here's the thing. We wanted to do pizza from day one and back when, back before we opened a brewery, when my husband, who is our, our brewer, he was home brewing. We used to have these events at our house every month called New Beer Friday. And we would invite everyone we knew and told them to invite everyone they knew to show up at our house. We'd have 70 people every month come to our house and try our beer and give us feedback and that kind of thing. Jake started working at, like my husband who can barely make a grilled cheese, to be clear, started, he decided he wanted to perfect this beer grain pizza crust and like make his own sauce and all he went on a whole it was a whole thing so it was supposed to be part of our process at the beginning and then once we started putting together an actual kitchen we realized like okay we need to get down the the rest of the menu because we didn't want to only be a pizza place we wanted to have other we're right next door to one of the best pizza places in town so we didn't want that to be hey we're the pizza brewery so we had to put the brakes on that for a little while. Um, like I said before, we were, we're very limited with our space. We've got a small kitchen here. Um, we wanted to get all of our systems down, everybody to feel comfortable back there and really like hone in our kitchen processes before we added on another piece. So one of the, the best parts about takeout for us, the takeout season was we got to, we started introducing pizzas during takeout. And so we did one pizza per week we do a specials menu every week. So our kitchen crew just gets to get weird and make stuff up. And the whole like dishwashers to line cooks to our kitchen manager, everybody gets to throw their hat in the ring with it. Um, so during takeout, we started, okay, one, we'll do one specialty pizza a week. And that kind of got everybody comfortable with the system a little bit. And now, now we've got uh, just a couple weeks ago, we just launched our, our full pizza menu, which is like five pizzas. So it, not it's not bringing in additional customers per se um but it's giving people something new and fun to try um we don't change our menu up very often most of the things on our menu have pretty much been here for the last year with the exception of those weekly specials um so it's something fun for especially for the people who've been coming here for a year and a half you know to have something different and new and um yeah not not driving crazy amounts of traffic here which is fine because truthfully we can't handle our, our current flow is about, that's where we feel comfortable. So I don't want to be Little Caesars. I don't want to be a, a giant pizza chain by any means, but it's something fun. It's different. It gives my kitchen crew another fun avenue to be creative and come up with some cool stuff. And yeah. 
Cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm sure it's delicious. Now, you just mentioned Kitchen Crew, and Andrew kind of touched on this earlier. Anyone can take this question, so anyone feel free to step in. But, you know, how do you separate your brewery staff from your kitchen staff? We if you have, don't, why, why do you, have you chosen to go that route? So, yeah, we just we have kitchen staff and we have front of house staff. So back of house, front of house. And generally, it's just because people have found their home in one place or another before they came to us. So um, everyone that I hired and my front of house crew, my servers, my bartenders, we knew we wanted experienced people. I didn't want to have to train a whole bunch of people. We wanted top of the line. So we, we hired folks that had way more experience than we did. Um, and they are, you know, they're, they're 10 year veteran servers, bartenders, that's their space. And back of house, um, you know, we hire people that have experience, but it's also kind of fun because we can hire some of my best people have never worked in a kitchen before, but they work hard. They're willing to follow instructions. They, they, they learn quickly. Um, and we've, we've seen some of our, our best kitchen staff are people who, you know, they need a job. They need somebody to give them a chance and they can I mean, anybody can flip a burger or work a panini press. Like it's, it's not that difficult. Um, so, so it's, it's fun to be able to give people more of an opportunity back there. Training new servers is tough and, and everybody needs their first job. You know, I was a first year server at one point in my life, but um, yeah, so we, we have kitchen staff, we have bar staff. Um, we actually, my kitchen manager is my day bartender also out here. And she's just, she's an incredible human being who she's had experience on both sides. And sometimes you'll see that where people will have worked both sides of the fence there, but um, she is a great asset because she's able to blend um, anybody who's worked in this industry knows the, the front of house versus back of house dichotomy is always a little bit dicey. Um, and she does a phenomenal job of helping everybody to work together and realizing like, Hey, we're all on the same team and kind of unifying that front of house, back of house situation. But Anyway, um, yeah, we occasionally get a couple of people who will go from back of house to like, okay, I'm going to be busboy, hostess, you know, that kind of thing here or there. But for the most part, it's it's pretty separated for us. Cool. No, Kevin, I'm curious how you handle this because you have essentially the two businesses. Do you have dedicated staff? So they flip back and forth. Tell us a little about how you manage that part of the operation. Yeah. Um, so because ours are two separate businesses, um, the, the kitchen staff, they're just kitchen staff. They work there. They work for the village beer garden. Um, and then we have a separate set of staff that works here at the brewery as, you know, bartenders or whatever. Um, so uh, they are technically a hundred percent separate. Um, but that said, they're all in the same family, right? Like they still get the same benefits. They still get take home beer. They get, you know, access to all the low fills they want, all that fun stuff. We don't, we want to make them feel like they're part of this, um, this group. But like when it comes to like cooking, like I, I've literally never even worked in a restaurant until we bought one. Um, I remember going back into the kitchen and the chef's like, hey, Kev, do you have hands? And I was like, yes. And like, I didn't know he wanted me to like run food for him. I had no idea what he was talking <laughs> about, you know? Um, so we try to just kind of play to our strengths, right? I handle production. I'm good at brewing. I've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, I'll let the chef handle the, the food ordering, you know? No, is the chef an owner of the business or he's someone you bring in to run that portion of the operation? Uh, he, he's an employee. Yeah, he's an employee. And has he been around a while? Uh, he's, so I, yeah, he's been with us since the beginning. So that's fantastic. since the beginning of the restaurant. So. Now, now, Tiffany, you know, you talked a little bit early on about just the interaction with the couple who runs the food portion of the operation. Are there any downsides to the arrangement or anything that you think could be a struggle for another business? trying to do something similar by bringing in a food partner to, you know, rent a space out essentially. Um, I don't think so. I guess if I could think the only really downfall, um, you know, compared to us and the way that the others are talking that they run is just the revenue from it. I mean, obviously increase in revenue is always good, but I also feel like you have to know what you're doing. You have to want to focus on that. And we just knew we didn't. Um, so, so yeah, I guess the downfall would be just, you know, obviously rest, less revenue. You're going to still have all that going on in your brewery, but you're not going to reap the benefits of it. Um, but then on the other hand, like it's increased our sales drastically. So it's still worth it in my opinion, if you're someone who 
just doesn't want to deal with the whole kitchen operation. Yeah, so for someone like Kevin and Andrew who really don't want to deal with the food side of things, you would recommend bringing in a partner to operate the kitchen? Um, I don't know if I would go backwards. I think if they've already got that set up, I would probably stick with it. Um, I couldn't imagine having the revenue, running your business on it, and then losing it. So I definitely wouldn't recommend going backwards, but I feel if you're someone who wants to bring someone in, that's what I meant. Um, bring in food, but don't want to go down the avenue. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would I would recommend it. I would just recommend you know really making sure that you can work with the other couple or the other person and you know and set clear boundaries in the beginning, which we kind of did. Um, I didn't want to be too strict and sound like you know I was a broken record on we have to do this and this and this, but I also wanted to make it very clear that like here's the way I do things. I'm very strict about these certain things. I admit I'm a control freak, so please don't take me wrong. <laughs> um, and they kind of learned that about me early on. They know now if I'm in the back saying, you should do this or you should do that, they either do it or they don't, and they know that's just how I am. So making sure you mesh well is, is super important. We hang out outside of the brewery. Um, we're at their house at least twice um, on the weekends a month. So we actually have a friendship there, and that's important, I think, as well. Yeah, you got to like the people you're spending that much time around. Now, for everybody else kind of looking at your operations, where they are today, I've right. just got a few more brief questions to throw at you. And these don't have to be long answers. You know, looking back on the food operation you've created in your business, is there anything that you would change and why? Just like quick rapid fire. Andrew, you're up. I know if we could do it again, I would build a kitchen here in the brewery instead of doing the food truck. It's just a better environment. You can have the equipment you need. You can, um, it's just food trucks are really tough. I mean, food truck owners often want to build brick and mortars, right? So it's cause it's kind of rough. Um, so if we could do it over again, I would have incorporated a kitchen from day one. Yeah. And we still might do that eventually. Uh, the city, although we're in an industrial space, the city allows us to do up to 50% of non main business and they even said during our planning meetings cool. if you want to put a kitchen there you can do that to follow what so. you do now kevin how about you any changes um, you'd make yeah cold storage always always more cold storage <laughs> like for the brewery and the restaurant it you can't have enough so what have you done to make that work for the current amount of space uh we actually literally just are renovating right now to do another like um like a cold room and a cool bot like the, the air, air conditioner unit in the window kind of thing. Um, just always, always need more of that. Good advice there. Now, Tamara, how about you? Is there anything that you would change about the operation with regards to like the food aspect? I think right now I'm pretty happy with how things are going. I mean, it has been a struggle over the years, but I think we've got it kind of figured out. Um, so I'm happy, the staff is happy, the food trucks, are actually they're actually pretty happy right now um so i don't think cool. i would change anything Thanks. currently and kaylee how about you i know you haven't been doing the food operation long but are there any changes you make i mean it seems like you are making changes but anything you do differently yeah um i mean i'll echo kevin double whatever you think you need for cold storage freezer space dry storage kitchen space itself like literally everything we could use we make it work it's tough though. And on days that we're at capacity, normal capacity, it's hard to keep up. I need double the size of my kitchen. Um, we've got a new 10 by 20 walk-in cooler coming in the next month, um, being installed outside. Our future expansion plans hopefully involve basically the kitchen taking over the entire brew house and building a new brew house. Um, so it's, it's space. It's, we underestimated how much food we would sell. Um, and yeah, all the storage space, dry, cold, frozen, all of it. You need more, more than you space. Can do. Seems to be yep. a trend we're seeing right now. Tiffany, yep. anything else you'd like to add? I know you talked a lot about the relationship with your partners. Anything you would do slightly different? Um, I actually agree with them on space. Um, I don't <laughs> think a brewery can ever have enough cold storage space. But yeah, when they started, they planned on being, you know, pretty simple, keeping a simple menu. So they didn't think they needed a ton of space. But we've learned already that we're out of space. We keep um, we keep going up in size with, you know, on the brewing side, and then they need more space as well. So 
Yeah, I would also say to double what you think you need. And if you don't use it right away, you probably will eventually. Well, let's do one more final question. I literally going to make this. I want you to list the top three items you would recommend from your experiences that a, someone opening a brewery with a tap room and food options would sell. You don't have to give any reason. It could be the most profitable items. It could be the easiest to cook items. What are those three items? And Andrew, we're going to start with you. <laughs> okay. I would say a burger, a pretzel, and a chicken tacos sell so, like that was such a big seller when the food truck was open. So You're making me hungry. Kevin, three items. Go. Uh, something shareable. Um, I'm in Canada, so you got to have a poutine. And then, uh, you know what? We, we're a Mexican restaurant. Like Andrew said, we sell a bunch of tacos. So You know, I like there. the shareable aspect you added there. Really good addition because it makes things nice to share. Mm -hmm. Now, Tamara, how about you? Three items. I know you keep it simple already. The beer brat, the soft pretzel. And then we do like a meat and cheese plate, a GCB charcuterie. So that those are like the top three easy to do. I've already got some meat and cheese lined up for dinner. I cannot wait. Now, Kaylee, three items. And they can't be three different pizzas. <laughs> no, I would skip pizzas. Um, a basic burger for sure. A soft pretzel with a good beer cheese, not a crappy beer cheese. And an option for gluten-free buns, pizza crust, like gluten-free is huge for us here. So something that's paying attention to dietary restrictions. Cool. Good addition there. Now, Tiffany, I know you're not running the kitchen yourself, but what are those three items you feel are the most important? I would also say a soft pretzel with beer cheese. They actually use our beer um, to make ours or make theirs. So that's a big selling point. Um, and then I would say like appetizer type combo. So basically bar food slash um, deep fried food. It's something that people like if they just come in and want to grab a snack and there's a group. Um, and then I'm not really sure what the third would be. They do really well with their dessert type options, which are simple funnel cake fries, um, deep fried Oreos and things like that. That's probably one of their biggest, biggest sellers as well. I love hearing what works in each of you guys' unique markets because I think that's kind of the lesson here. Besides space, which everybody needs a ton of, everything else is gonna be somewhat really dependent on who your clientele is. And Andrew, Kevin, Tamara, Kaylee, and Tiffany, I really appreciate you all finding the time this early in the morning. Kaylee, I'm a little jealous that you had a beer, but you know, I'll have one later today, but it's a really good time. I think the group's really going to appreciate your feedback. So thanks for sharing your experiences with food. And everybody, thanks for watching today. I hope you find this valuable. Take note of their top three items. And everybody, I will see you later. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Thank you.